Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton, and in this video we're going to finish up our discussion on polynomial functions and their graphs. So in the previous video we talked about how to identify polynomial functions, how to recognize some of the characteristics of the graph of polynomial function, also talking about the end behavior for the graph of polynomial function using its leading term, and we also use factoring to find the real zeros of polynomial functions. In this video we're going to talk about how to understand the relationship between the degree and the number of turning points in a graph of a polynomial function, and we're also going to graph polynomial functions. So the following guidelines will be used to graph polynomial functions which will include finding the real zeros, choosing test values on each subinterval between x-intercepts, and also using the end behavior to help us provide a sketch of the graph. So these guidelines for graphing a polynomial function. Step one is to factor the polynomial to find all its real zeros, and then these real zeros will correspond to x-intercepts on the graph of the polynomial function. Number two, we're going to make a table of values for a polynomial function. We're going to include test points to determine whether the graph of the polynomial function either lies above the x-axis or below the x-axis on each subinterval, determined by the real zeros. And then we are also going to make sure that we include the y-intercept as an important plotted point on the graph of a polynomial function. Number three, we're going to determine the end behavior of the polynomial function, which we talked about in the previous video. And then number four, we're going to plot the x-intercepts and the y-intercept and other points that we found out from step two using the test points, sketch a smooth curve that passes through each of the points that we found, and also exhibits the required end behavior for the polynomial function's graph. So example five, graphing polynomial functions. Graph each of the following polynomial functions using the intercepts, the zeros, the end behavior, and analyzing the behavior of the graph near each x-intercept, or real zero. Number one, we're going to graph the polynomial function f of x is equal to x cubed, subtract 2x squared, subtract 5x plus 6. So let's find out what the end behavior is for the polynomial function first. Notice that the leading term is 1x cubed, so the polynomial function has degree 3, which is an odd number, and also the polynomial function has a leading coefficient of 1, which is positive. And so the end behavior, notice that the ends of the graph will be opposite behavior, so its end behavior is that on the far left end of the graph, the graph will fall, and as you go to the right, the graph will rise. And then using error notation to describe this end behavior, if x is approaching negative infinity, so the far left end of the graph, the y values, f of x, also decrease without bounds, so f of x approaches negative infinity. On the right end of the graph, if x approaches positive infinity, then the y values increase without bound, so f of x approaches positive infinity. So now we're going to find out what are the real zeros of the polynomial function. So find the real zeros of the polynomial function by taking the polynomial function, factor the polynomial, so this polynomial function will factor as x subtract 1 times x plus 2 times x minus 3, Set it equal to zero, so you can set the y value equal to zero. Now you want to find out what are the x-intercepts, or find out the x values that make the y value zero. And so if you have a product of three different factors that give you zero, at least one of them must be zero. So that means x minus one equals zero, x plus two equals zero, or x subtract three equals zero. When you solve these resulting linear equations, you find out that x is equal to one, x is equal to negative two, or x equals positive three. So the x-intercepts are when y equals zero, we have x equals one, x equals negative two, and x equals three are the real zeros of this polynomial function. That means one comma zero, that point, negative two comma zero, and also three comma zero are x-intercepts for the graph of this polynomial function. Now the y-intercept. The y-intercept is found out when x equals zero. So if you substitute zero into your function, you'll have f of zero is equal to zero cubed, subtract two times zero squared, minus five times zero plus six. If you simplify this y value, you'll come up with six. So the y-intercept is 0, 6. The graph will cross the y-axis at 6. So now what we're actually going to do is find out what is the behavior of the graph near each x-intercept or each real zero for the polynomial function. So we're going to make a sign chart, or what's called a number line. You plot your x-intercepts or your real zeros of the polynomial function so that it will be negative 2, 1, and 3. So notice that I've labeled this number line with an x because this represents the all possible x values that are important for this polynomial function. So I have negative 2, 1, and 3 divides up this number line up into four subintervals. x values less than negative 2, x values between negative 2 and 1, x values between 1 and 3, and x values that are greater than 3. So now I'm going to pick test points that represent any x value over those subintervals. So I'm going to pick x equals negative 3 because it's on the left side or less than negative 2. I'm going to pick x equals 0 because it's between negative 2 and, and positive 1 for x values. I'm going to pick x equals 2 because it's between x equals 1 and x equals 3 and x equals 4 is greater than 3, so I'm going to pick that as the last test value. Each of these test values go into the original function so that you can find out the y value. If the y value is positive, that means that the graph is above the x-axis, and if your y value is negative, then you'll have the graph is below the x-axis on each subinterval. And so if you substitute x equals negative 3 into your function, you'll find out the y value is negative. That means on the left side of x equals negative 2, 
then you'll have the graph below the x-axis. If I plug in x equals 0, well, that was the y-intercept. It was positive 6. So that means I have a positive y value whenever I'm between x equals negative 2 and x equals 1. So I'm above the x-axis on that subinterval. If I substitute in x equals 2 into the polynomial function, I'll have a negative y value. So again, that means between x equals 1 and x equals 3, the graph will be below the x-axis. And if x is greater than 3, I'm going to choose x equals 4. If I plug that x equals 4 into the polynomial function, I'll have a positive y value, which means that the graph is above the x-axis whenever x is greater than 3. So let's see what the graph will look like if we make a sketch of the graph using all these test points and also the x-intercepts and the y-intercept that we found. So notice we have the x-intercept at negative 2 comma 0, 1 comma 0, and also 3 comma 0. x equals negative 2, x equals 1, and x equals 3 were the real zeros of this polynomial function, so those are the x-intercepts. We have a y-intercept of 0 comma 6. And now let's use our number line or sign chart to describe what is happening on each subinterval of the graph. So if x is less than negative 2, the graph is below the x-axis. And we knew this because the end behavior said as x approaches negative infinity, the y values were decreasing without bound. So as I go to the left forever, the graph will go down or fall to the left. And so now I have to pass through negative 2 comma 0 because negative 2 and 1 are now above the x-axis. So between negative 2 and 1, I must pass through 0 comma 6, which was the y-intercept. Then I have to come back down to 1 comma 0 because between x equals 1 and x equals 3, I'm now below the x-axis. So between x equals 1 and 3, I'm below the x-axis. And then notice if I'm on the right side of x equals 3, the graph has to be above the x-axis. Well, we knew that from the end behavior. If x is going towards infinity, if x is increasing without bound, the y values were also increasing without bound, and the graph was rising as you go to the right. And so this is a sketch for the graph of this polynomial function. f of x equals x cubed, subtract 2x squared, subtract 5x plus 6. It has x-intercepts at negative 2, 1, and 3, and the y-intercept was 0, 6. And it looks like the graph will be above the x-axis between negative 2 and 1, below the x-axis between x equals 1 and x equals 3, and the other two parts we can find out using the end behavior. All right, number 2. Let's graph this polynomial function. g of x is equal to negative 2x to the fourth, subtract x cubed, plus 3x squared. So notice that g of x is a polynomial function with a degree 4, that's the highest power on the variable x, and the degree is 4, which is an even number. The leading coefficient of this polynomial function is negative 2, which is a negative number. So the end behavior can be found out first using the leading coefficient and the degree of this polynomial function. Since you have degree even, the ends of the graph will either be going down on both ends or going up on both ends. Well, since the leading coefficient is negative, the graph will fall to the left and also fall to the right, which means as x approaches negative infinity, the y values, g of x, decrease without bounds, so g of x approaches negative infinity, and if x increases without bounds, so if x goes towards positive infinity, the y values also decrease without bounds, so g of x approaches negative infinity. So now once we have the end behavior for the polynomial function, now we can find the real zeros of the polynomial function. g of x is equal to negative 2x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 3x squared. If you want to find the real zeros of the polynomial function, set the y value equal to zero, or set the entire function equal to zero. Notice that you can factor out a negative x squared from each of the three terms of this polynomial function. So negative x squared factored out, You'll have a 2x squared from the first term, you'll have a positive x from the second term, and you have a minus 3 from the third term. So notice if you factor out a negative, it'll actually change each of the signs that you have left over inside the parentheses. And so now, notice if you have a negative x squared on the outside, let's see if this polynomial that's inside the parentheses, this trinomial, will factor any further. And it does. 2x squared plus x subtract 3, you can factor this using the AC method to factor it as x subtract 1, and also 2x plus 3 is the other factor for this polynomial function. And so now, if you have three factors multiplied together and the answer is zero, at least one of the factors must be zero. So negative x squared equals zero, or the x minus one equals zero, or two x plus three equals zero. And so if negative x squared equals zero, divide both sides by negative one, you'll get x squared equals zero, and x squared is equal to zero only if x is equal to zero. And if x minus one equals zero, that gives you x equals one. And if two x plus three equals zero, if you solve for x, you'll get x equals negative three over two. So it looks like we have three real zeros for this polynomial function. We have x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals negative 3 divided by 2. So we know that real zeros correspond to x-intercepts for this polynomial function graph. So if x-intercepts are occurring when y equals 0, or when you set the entire function equal to 0, x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals negative 3 halves, those were the x-intercepts, or the real zeros. So 0 comma 0, 1 comma 0, and negative 3 halves comma 0. Those are points where the graph will either cross or touch the x-axis and turn around. And we also can find out the y-intercept. The y-intercept is occurring when x equals 0. 
So if you substitute x equals 0 into this polynomial function, you'll find out that g of 0 is equal to negative 2 times 0 to the 4th minus 0 cubed plus 3 times 0 squared. And if you simplify this y value, you'll find out that it's 0. So if x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0. And we already knew this because the x-intercept was 0, 0. 0, 0 is an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So the next thing to find out after you found out the real zeros with this polynomial function is to make a sign chart or a number line. So we have a number line that represents all x values that makes up this polynomial function's graph. We have real zeros at x equals negative 3 halves, 0, and 1. And so this divides the number line up into four different regions again. So you have x values that are less than negative 3 halves, x values between negative 3 halves and 0, x values between 0 and 1, and x values greater than 1. And so let's pick test values that actually would represent each subinterval. So x equals negative 2 is less than negative 3 halves, so we'll pick that first. x equals negative 1 is between x equals negative 3 halves and x equals 0. Between 0 and 1, I'll pick x equals a half. And larger than 1, I'll pick x equals 2. So now these test values go into the original function, the polynomial function, to find out the y value. So if you substitute x equals negative 2 in, you'll find out the y value must be a negative. So that means that the graph must be below the x-axis for x values that are less than negative 3 halves. Well, again, we knew that from the end behavior. As x approaches negative infinity, the y values were decreasing without bounds, which meant that the graph falls to the left, which means we have to be below the x-axis on the left side of x equals negative 3 halves. If you substitute x equals negative 1 into the polynomial function, you'll find out the y value is positive. So that means if we were below the x-axis and now we're above the x-axis, we must have crossed the x-axis at x equals negative 3 halves. Now let's plug in x equals a half. If you plug in x equals a half into your polynomial function, the y value is still positive. So you're above the x-axis on the left side of x equals 0, but then you're still above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 0. So it looks like you do touch the x-axis at 0, 0, but it just turns around. It stays on the same side of the x-axis. And if you substitute x equals 2 into your polynomial function, you'll find out the y value is, is a negative number. And so this means that the graph is below the x-axis. Again, we knew this from the end behavior because as x approaches positive infinity, the y values were decreasing without bounds. So g of x was approaching negative infinity. So we're below the x-axis on the far right end of the graph. And so if you put all this information together, you can find out a sketch for the graph of this polynomial function. The graph will cross the x-axis at negative 3 halves because you are below the x-axis and then you're above the x-axis on the other side of the x-intercept. You'll be above the x-axis until you get to x equals 0 because you're x-intercept was 0, 0, so it'll touch the origin at 0, 0, but then it stays on the same side of the x-axis. It stays above the x-axis on the right side of x equals 0 until you get to x equals 1. So it looks like the graph will just bounce off the x-axis at x equals 0. The graph will go up, and then eventually you'll be at x equals 1 right on the x-axis again, and then on the other side of x equals 1, the graph is below the x-axis, so you have to cross the x-axis at x equals 1. So you cross the x-axis at negative 3 halves, and you cross the x-axis when x equals 1, but it looks like at x equals 0, the graph touches the x-axis and turns around, or bounces off the x-axis. And if you plot all these test points, you'll get this sketch for the polynomial function's graph. You have an x-intercept at negative 3 halves, comma, 0, an x-intercept and a y-intercept at 0, comma, 0, an x-intercept at 1, comma, 0. And so this is a sketch for the graph of the polynomial function g of x equals negative 2x to the fourth, subtract x cubed plus 3x squared. So one of the things that we may have noticed from the last couple of examples is that sometimes the graph will cross the x-axis and sometimes it'll touch the x-axis and turn around and stay on the same side of the x-axis. It'll look like it'll just touch the x-axis and bounce off. Well, this is what's called shape of the graph near a real zero. In the previous example, we noticed that near the x-intercepts, the graph of the polynomial function may either cross the x-axis or touch the x-axis and bounce off at the x-intercept and stay on the same side of the x-axis. So this is what's called multiplicity of a zero. The definition is, if x equals c is a 0 of the polynomial function p of x, then you have an x minus c is the factor, so that is an equivalent statement. If x equals c is a 0, x minus c is a factor for this polynomial function. If this factor, x minus c, occurs m times, so m is a number, in the factorization of the polynomial function, then we say that x equals c is a 0 of multiplicity m. And if the multiplicity of the 0 is an odd number, that means that the graph of p of x, the polynomial function, will cross the x-axis at the x-intercept c comma 0. However, if the multiplicity of the 0 is an even number, then the graph of the polynomial function will touch the x-axis at the x-intercept c comma 0, and it will bounce off or stay on the same side of the x-axis. So this graph gives you an example of what is the difference between having a real 0 of odd multiplicity and even multiplicity. So notice that the graph crosses the x-axis at these two x-values, 
That means if it's crossing the x-axis, that means that the factor that corresponds to that real zero must have occurred an odd number of times. And so you have an odd multiplicity for those two real zeros for this polynomial function. Now, if the graph touches the x-axis and bounces off and stays on the same side of the x-axis, that means that that real zero has even multiplicity, and that means that the factor x attracts c for this real zero must have occurred an even number of times. And again, if you have an odd multiplicity, that means that the graph crosses the x-axis. So what we can do is use the real zero's multiplicity to determine the behavior of the graph when you get close to the x-intercept. Do you cross the x-axis at the x-intercept, or do you touch the x-axis and stay on the same side of the x-axis at the x-intercept? Let's take a look at example 6. Example 6 says real zeros and their multiplicities. For the polynomial function, p of x is equal to, and this has already been factored, it's 5 been factored out from all the terms, so 5 is the greatest common factor, times x attract 2 to the first power, times x plus 3 all to the second power, times the quantity x minus 1 half all to the fourth power. We're going to determine the real zeros of the polynomial function, and we're also going to determine their multiplicities. State whether the graph of the polynomial function crosses the x-axis or touches the x-axis and stays on the same side at each real zero. So if we want to find out the real zeros of this polynomial function, we need to find out what are the values that make the entire polynomial function zero. So set the entire polynomial function once it's factored equal to zero. And now, if you have a product that is equal to zero, one of the factors must be zero. Well, five can't be zero, so ignore it. x attract two could be zero, or x plus three all squared could be zero, or x minus one half all to the fourth power could be zero. That means x minus two equals zero, or the only way you have something squared is equal to zero is if x plus three was zero. And same thing, if x minus one half to the fourth is equal to zero, that means x minus one half must have been zero. And so this gives you three different real zeros for this polynomial function. You get x equals two because x minus two equals zero. You get x equals negative three because x plus three equals zero. And you get x equals positive half because x minus one half equals zero. And so you'll have x-intercepts at 2 comma 0, negative 3 comma 0, and 1 half comma 0, because each of these x values make the y value 0. So now we can talk about the multiplicities of each real 0, now that we found each of the three. So if x equals 2 is a real 0, how many times did the factor x attract 2 occur in the factorization? Well, x attract 2 only occurs one time. And so this has multiplicity 1. So x equals 2 is a real 0. With multiplicity 1, well, 1 is an odd number, so it has odd multiplicity. And so the graph will cross the x-axis at the x-intercept 2 comma 0. Now, on the other hand, x equals negative 3. x equals negative 3 was the real 0. The factor that gave us that real 0 was x plus 3 all squared. So the multiplicity of this real 0, x equals negative 3, is 2. And so x equals negative 3 is a real 0 with an even multiplicity, because the multiplicity is an even number. That means that the graph will touch the x-axis at the x-intercept, negative 3 comma 0, and the graph will stay on the same side of the x-axis. And then the last real zero that we had was x equals positive 1 half. Well, the factor that gave us x equals 1 half would be x minus 1 half, and it was all raised to the fourth power. And so the multiplicity of x equals 1 half is 4, and 4 is an even number, so x equals 1 half has even multiplicity, which means that the graph will touch the x-axis at 1 half comma 0, the x-intercept, and the graph will again stay on the same side of the x-axis. So let's finish up this video by talking about local maxima and local minima of polynomial functions. So remember that a point a comma f of a, which is the highest point on the graph in the neighborhood of x equals a, then f of a is called a local maximum value or relative maximum value. If the point b comma f of b is the lowest point on the graph in the neighborhood of x equals b, then the y value f of b is called a local minimum value or relative minimum value. There are several hills and valleys in the graph of a polynomial function, which means you may have several local maxima and several local minima for a polynomial function. Well, for a polynomial function, anytime you have local maxima and local minima, these are what's called local extrema. And we also know that the number of local extrema must be less than the degree of the polynomial function. In fact, the following theorem is actually going to give us a greatest number of local extrema that can be expected when graph in a polynomial function. So the theorem, local extrema of polynomial functions, if the polynomial function p of x is equal to a sub n, x to the n plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1 plus dot dot dot, a sub 1, x plus a sub 0. Let's say this is a polynomial function where the highest power of x is n, so the degree of this polynomial function is n. Then the theorem says the graph of the polynomial function p of x will have at most n subtract 1 turning points 
or local extrema because local extrema are the local maximum and local minimum. So for example, let's say we have a polynomial function f of x is equal to negative 3x to the 6th plus 4x to the 4th, subtract 10x squared plus 11. The leading term for this polynomial function is negative 3x to the 6th, so the degree of this polynomial function is 6. And so the theorem says, since the degree of this polynomial function is 6, we'll have at most 6 subtract 1, or 5 turning points, or local extrema, for this polynomial function. So this theorem is really useful for checking your sketch of a graph of a polynomial function. If you have more turning points than you should expect, then you might want to go back and check your graph for the polynomial function. You can have at most one less turning points than the degree of the polynomial function. Well, you may have less than that, but you can have at most one less than the degree of the polynomial function. So although the statement seems rather simple and straightforward, determining the location of local extrema, local maxima, and local minimum values actually requires calculus. To find out how far the graph goes up in terms of the hill or how far down does the graph go for the valley actually requires us to find out where does the graph change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, and this will require calculus. The best that we can do is use the test values that we had from our sign chart or number line to plot those points and find that the graph must pass through those points. But we may not know what the local maxima or local minimum values are for the polynomial function. So this finishes our video on polynomial functions and their graphs. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about dividing polynomials.